In this video note, we shall be taking our first proper look at how Java source code is used to define classes. The source code elements we shall look at will be used in nearly every class you ever write, so the topics are important ones. For the exploration, we shall be using the Naive Ticket Machine project from Objects First with Java by David Barnes and Michael Curling. The Ticket Machine class is designed to model the sort of functionality that's commonly found in automated ticket machines in bus stations and subways, for example. To get the most out of this video, you should at least have experimented with that project. In a previous video note, we did the preparatory exploration in order to help us understand the source code we shall be seeing in this one. The source code elements we shall look at are the class header, the class body, its fields and constructor. From our previous exploration, we saw that in order to create a ticket machine, we have to supply a price for its tickets. From the inspector view, we saw that all Ticket Machine objects have three fields called Price, Balance and Total. We noted that the cost parameter supplied when a Ticket Machine is created is stored permanently in its Price field. When money is inserted into the machine, it's stored temporarily in the Balance field. And when a ticket is issued, the balance is transferred to the total field. We also identified that the individually set price of each ticket appears in the printed ticket. Let's now look at the source code of Ticket Machine to see where some of the features we've observed have actually come from. To open the source code, either right-click over the class and select the red Open Editor menu item, or simply double-click on the class. The editor window consists of essentially four areas. At the top are some menu buttons. At the bottom is a blank area that's used by the Java compiler for reporting errors. In the center is the main editing area containing the source code we're interested in. And to the right is an outline navigational view of the file, showing where we currently are viewing in the overall file. As this is our first proper look at source code, it's probably worth making an important point about the structure and layout of what we see in the Ticket Machine class. Firstly, like all programming languages, Java has some very strict rules about what may or may not be written in a class definition. In some ways, these are a bit like the rules of natural language. For instance, when writing in English, the rule is that sentences should start with a capital letter and end with a full stop or period, or something equivalent like a question mark. Similarly, in spoken languages, it would be correct to say, I can write Java programs, but incorrect to say, write programs Java I can. However, we all know that those natural language rules get broken all the time, and on the whole we can still understand what people mean, even if they get their spelling or grammar slightly wrong. This is not the case with programming languages. The strict rules of Java must not be broken if you want to get your program to run. There is no slack in this principle. It's the job of the Java compiler, notice the compile button at the top of the editor window, to enforce those rules. The Java compiler is stricter with its red pen than any teacher ever was. To help you with this, as we look through the source code in this video note and others, we'll mention some of these strict rules from time to time. In addition to Java's strict rules, there are also some informal rules that programmers often apply when writing Java code. In fact, it's probably more accurate to call these conventions rather than rules. Conventions are something you adopt by choice. The Java compiler will not care about them at all and will not check that you have adhered to them. The kinds of conventions we're talking about here relate to the way in which we lay out or format our source code and the names we choose for variables and methods. You might wonder why we bother with conventions if the compiler doesn't care about them and if breaking them won't affect whether a program runs or not. The primary reason is that adopting these conventions makes code easier to work with, both for you, the person writing it, and, just as importantly, others who will read it. Whether that other person is someone giving you a grade on a course, a colleague who's working on the same project, or someone you've shared your code with because it's a great piece of code. So as we look through source code, we'll often mention the conventions that we are using. If you want to take a look at some of those conventions, you can find them documented in the Style Guide in the Objects First with Java book. The first thing we see at the start of the Ticket Machine source file is a block of explanatory text. This is called a comment. 
This comment describes the overall purpose of the class. It also says who wrote it. It's a good idea to get into the habit of identifying yourself in code you've authored and a version identification, in this case a date. Next comes the part that gives the class its name. This is the header of the class. Here is one place where the rules of Java are strict and those three words, public, class and ticket machine, must come in exactly that order. Also the words public and class must be written entirely in lowercase letters. You cannot capitalize the P or the C for instance. If you look at the source code of all classes in this book, you'll see exactly the same pattern in each case. Public, class, class name. So this will also be the case for the classes you write. On the line immediately below the class header is an opening curly bracket or curly brace. This character is used a lot in Java programs. It always marks the start of something. Here it marks the start of the body of the ticket machine class. For every opening curly bracket, there is always a matching closing curly bracket. This is another strict Java rule. Because they are so small, it's easy to miss them out or have one too many, and the Java compiler will always pick up those errors. By convention, we always put the opening curly bracket as a class body on a line of its own, as the first character of the line. If we scroll to the end of the class, we'll find the corresponding closing curly bracket that marks the end of the class. Again, by convention, we place this bracket on a line by itself and right at the left edge of the source file. Everything between those two curly brackets is the body of the class, and the body contains the Java elements that make ticket machine objects behave in the way they do. Notice that if we highlight one of the curly brackets, or simply place the cursor next to it, the matching bracket is highlighted in the editor. You will find it extremely useful to know this when it comes to trying to work out why the compiler is complaining about a missing bracket. The first thing inside the body of the class is a section consisting of six lines. It's important to be observant when reading code, so notice that these six lines are made up of three similar pairs. The first line of each pair is a comment that describes the purpose of the second line. A single line comment is introduced by two forward slash characters, after which we can write any commentary we like up to the end of the line. What we're seeing here is the definition of three fields that each ticket machine object has. You'll recall that this is similar to what we saw in the inspector view of the ticket machine object. Notice the text to the left of the value box in the inspector. This text came directly from this section of the source code. Each field definition consists of three components. A visibility, private, a type, int here, short for integer, and a name. The end of each definition is marked by a semicolon character. The Java rules for defining fields are strict, and the order of the elements we see in each definition cannot be changed. The order must be visibility, type, name, and semicolon. Following another widely used convention, the names we've chosen for the three fields all start with a lowercase letter. In fact, the only names we start with an uppercase letter will be class names. Adhering to this convention makes source code easier to read. If a field's name were made up from multiple words, time of day for instance, then we would use camel case and capitalize the O of of and the D of day, but still keep the T of time in lower case. Another convention we've used here is that the section of fields has not been written up directly against the left edge of the editor window, rather we've used a little bit of indentation. This is our way of showing that the fields are conceptually inside the class body. The convention is that every time we write an opening curly bracket, what follows is indented by four spaces. The BlueJ editor is already set up to help with this convention, so you'll find that the tab key indents code, and typing a closing curly bracket moves the indentation back again. Finally, we include a blank line to separate the section of fields from whatever follows. What comes next is another block comment, similar in style to the one we saw at the start of the class file. There the comment described what immediately followed, which was the whole class. Here the comment also describes what immediately follows, which is the constructor. The constructor of a class is the part that's responsible for setting up everything properly inside an object when it's being created, so that it's ready to use immediately thereafter. It's the constructor that gets called whenever we right-click over a class in the class diagram and select New Circle new triangle, new ticket machine, and so on. It's impossible to create an object without going via its class's constructor. 
However, once an object has been created, the constructor plays no further role in its life and cannot be called again on that object. By convention, we place the constructor immediately after the fields. This is not a Java requirement, but it does visually link the fields and constructor together as they are closely associated with one another. Something that is a Java rule is that a constructor must have the same name as its class. So, immediately below the introductory comment, we see public ticket machine. That tells us that this is a constructor. Public specifies the visibility of the constructor, just as private specified the visibility of the fields. However, we won't go into the significance of the difference here. That's an issue of encapsulation, which is covered in the book. The constructor name must exactly match that of the class, exactly the same combination of upper and lower case letters, because Java is a case-sensitive language, which means that similar-looking names in a different mix of cases are considered to be different names. Immediately after the name of the constructor is an opening round bracket. Be careful to distinguish between round brackets and curly brackets. They mean completely different things in Java, and they're not interchangeable. The round bracket marks the start of what's called a parameter list. The end of the parameter list is marked by a closing round bracket. Round brackets always come in matching pairs, just like curly brackets. What is a parameter list? You will recall that when we created ticket machine objects, we had to supply the cost of tickets. We now know that the process of creation involves calling the ticket machine's constructor. So the value we supply on creation as the cost of tickets is received by the constructor so that it can set up the price field properly. It's the parameter list that supports this transfer process. If we look back at the new ticket machine menu item, we see that it matches the header of the constructor. Roughly speaking, we can think of the parameter to a constructor as a variable that receives an item of data from outside an object and makes it available inside the object. So the parameter list here tells us that the constructor will receive a single parameter value when it is called, and the type of that value will be integer. The parameter list defines a variable to store that value, here called cost, so that we can refer to it in the body of the constructor. Different classes will have different requirements for the initialization of their objects. Some classes don't need to receive parameters via their constructors, circle and square in the figures project for instance, so their parameter lists will be empty. Other classes will need to receive more than one value, so their parameter lists will define more than one variable. The final thing to look at in this video note is the body of the constructor. Once again, an opening curly bracket marks the start of the body. Notice that we place this curly bracket immediately under the P of public in the line above. If you look down a few lines, you'll see the matching closing curly bracket and that this is lined up with the opening one. Java's terminology for code enclosed between a pair of curly brackets is a block. Notice too that we've indented the code inside the constructor's body block by four spaces, as we described earlier. The constructor's body contains three statements, one for each of the class's fields. This is a common pattern. In most classes, we should expect to see a very close relationship between the fields and what goes on in the body of its constructor. This is because the constructor's primary role is to ensure that every instance is properly initialized when it is created, and proper initialization necessarily means ensuring that the fields contain sensible values right from the start. Each of the three statements here is called an assignment statement. An assignment statement consists of a variable name, followed by the assignment operator, which in Java is the equal symbol, followed by a value, and terminated by a semicolon. The effect is to copy the value on the right-hand side of the assignment symbol into the variable on the left-hand side. In other words, an assignment statement stores a value into a variable. Here the values assigned to two of the fields are very simple, zero, but the assignment to the price field requires a bit more explanation. Recall that the parameter cost received the amount passed into the constructor saying how much these tickets should cost. In the first assignment, that value is now being assigned to the price field so that it can be remembered when issuing tickets. This is necessary because once the constructor has finished, the cost parameter will be thrown away. Unless its value is stored somewhere more permanent, that value will be lost. By copying the value into price, which remains part of the ticket machine object throughout its life, the cost of tickets is remembered and can be used by the object. We've covered a lot of ground in this video note, 
so we won't go any further here. However, you can find plenty more in the associated chapter of Objects First with Java. In summary, we've taken our first proper look at part of the source code of a Java class. We've seen that Java has some strict rules about what can be written, and those rules cannot be broken. But there are also conventions that we choose to adopt to make our code easier to understand and accessible to other people. Java classes have a header and a body that is enclosed between a pair of curly brackets. Fields are used to store data values to be used by an object throughout its life. A constructor takes control when an object is created and makes sure the object is properly initialized. Parameters are used to receive data from outside the object to be used inside. Parameters to the constructor are used to receive data from outside the object to be used inside it.